In this video, I want to show you one of the most unexpectedly challenging problems that I've ever put on a calculus test. And I want to use that to motivate a discussion about what I learned from the problem, but perhaps more importantly, what I think a lot of us do when we're going about learning mathematics and how we can learn and teach mathematics more effectively. I actually want to start with a simpler problem first, so skip down to the next timestamp if you want to see the hard one immediately. The question is, can you take the derivative of this function when x is positive? This is a completely standard example of something called logarithmic differentiation, so let me just walk you through the process. I'll note that the other rules for differentiation, like the chain rule or the power rule or the product rule, none of them quite applies here, so I have to do something different. And the trick is, because I have an exponent, I can leverage the power of logarithms. So I'm going to begin by taking the logarithm of both sides. Then I have a logarithm of x to the sine x, I have an exponent, and one of our logarithm rules is that whenever you have logarithm of a to the b, you can bring that exponent out the front. So I write this as the logarithm of y is sine of x times the logarithm of x. So now I'm going to take the derivative of both sides. On the left-hand side, well, this is straightforward. The logarithm of y is just 1 over y, and then via chain rule times y prime. But notice what's happened on the right side. The fact that we used that logarithmic rule to bring down the exponent means now I'm taking the derivative of a product. And I know how to take the derivative of a product via product rule, cosine of x times logarithm x plus sine of x times 1 over x. 1 over x is the derivative of logarithm. I'm almost done. I noticed that it's y prime divided by y, and I was really interested in y prime. I was interested in the derivative. So I'm just going to multiply the y up. It's just y times everything I've written. And remember, y was x to the sine of x, so I'll just replace that. This is my final answer. There's actually another way to do it too that I want to very briefly mention. If I have y is x to the sine of x, I can get a logarithm in another way, which is e to the logarithm of the function, e and logarithm are inverses of each other, so I can just input this, it doesn't change anything. And then I do the same tricks. I've got a sine x in the exponent, I can bring it out the front, and a combination of chain rule and product rule gives me the exact result that I had just seen before. If you want to check your solutions to problems like these, you can always use Maple Calculator, which is the sponsor for today's video. Let me put in x to the sine x. And what you get beyond just the pretty graph of it is the ability to differentiate with respect to x. And then if I click the steps button, it's going to show me exactly how to do it step by step. And you'll see that MapleLearn is using this method where I replace the x to the sine x with e to the logarithm. And then you apply the chain rule and you can go step by step through that entire process. I think it's really powerful to have tools like these to support your learning of core calculus computations. So definitely check Maple Calculator out. The link is down in the description. Regardless, x to the sine x is not what I would consider a challenging calculus problem. Depending on what course I was teaching, it would probably get something upwards like 75% of first-year calculus students solving this problem correctly. Okay, so now let me show you the problem that really surprised me. It's this. It's x to the sine x, exactly what we had before, plus x to the cosine of x. I put this on the test and very surprising to me, only 12% of students actually got the right answer. So why is this harder? Well, okay, I mean, it looks like a logarithmic differentiation problem. Indeed, I was meaning it to be a logarithmic differentiation problem. I wasn't thinking it was meant to be harder than the other one. So what do I do? I take a logarithm of both sides. I have those exponents like sine and cos. I bring them out the front, but I can't do that. That's not allowed. If I'm taking logarithm of the right-hand side, well, then I have to be faithful about that. That's logarithm of the entire right-hand side all at once. And because there is a sum there, this is logarithm of a sum, I don't have any log rules that apply to the logarithm of a sum. So I don't know what this is via this method. Well, there's a sort of related logarithm rule, the logarithm of a product like a times b, is logarithm of a plus logarithm of b, but that's not what I have going on in this problem. And indeed, what I got was student after student after student who was using, in effect, the wrong log rule. Okay, so what should you do in that case? Well, I'm trying to take a derivative of this. So I could just do each of the two things separately. Like, I can do the derivative of x to the sine of x, I've already done that. 
I could do the derivative of x to the cosine of x. I could do that, it wouldn't be much harder. And then whatever results were, I could just add them. That is, maybe I would just call the left one y1, the right one y2. We'd already seen how to take the derivative of y1, so I'm just copy and pasting it. And then for the derivative of x cosine of x, it's no harder. So I could go back and I could literally just do very quickly the exact same procedure with that y2. It would be exactly the same idea, just coses instead of sines. And so I could just add that result together. That is, at a high level, this problem is exactly the same as the previous problem, or maybe doing the previous problem two times and adding them. But the trick is, I have to pause and think that I can't use a logarithm rule directly. I have to separate it out, and I have to do two sort of separate sub-calculations somewhere else, separate it on my page, get the results separately, and only at the end can I add them. That is the distinction that meant that only 12% of students were managing to solve this problem correctly. Now, what I really want to do is use that example to motivate a discussion about learning and teaching of mathematics. But first, if you want more practice at logarithmic differentiation, then down in the description I've left a link to a Maple Learn document that I made that has a whole bunch of practice examples where logarithmic differentiation is the basic tool that you should be using. And what's really nice about Maple Learn is that you can practice these problems or any other problems that you type in and it will check your answer and let you know whether you've got the right result. Okay, so what was really going on that led to so many students screwing up this particular problem? First, I want to acknowledge that this problem is way off on the side of a spectrum that I sometimes label procedural fluency through to conceptual reasoning. That is, this is the problem where there's a procedure and you need to know and execute the procedure, but you don't need to know a lot about the conceptual ideas of what is a derivative, what does it look like. You don't, for example, have to use Maple Calculator to graph what this function is or say anything about its behavior. This is just a recipe that you're expected to execute. A little later in the video, I'm going to talk about whether I think procedural fluency problems are actually a good thing to even include in a calculus test or not, but regardlessly, that is what we're doing here. We are learning procedural fluency. But what I think really happened wasn't that a whole bunch of students didn't know their log rules. Indeed, when I asked a whole bunch of students in office hours who had screwed up this problem, they actually could quote at me the right logarithm rule that the logarithm of a times b is the logarithm of a plus the logarithm of b. It wasn't a lack of knowledge of log rules. The big issue, in my mind, is that there is a standard procedure, a recipe, a sort of cookie cutter format for how many of these logarithmic differentiation problems go where you take the logarithm on both sides and you use rules. Students have seen that, they practice that on homework, they've seen it in class. This is a well-established thing in their mind. And so what I think happens is that we tend to go a little bit on autopilot. We recognize the category of problems and then we just execute the procedure with out stepping and pausing and reflecting and making sure that every single step of that procedure is indeed justified in this problem. If the procedure is always taking exponents and bringing them out in front of the logarithm, why not do it here without carefully checking what log rule we're actually doing? Because, I mean, it looks a lot like what we've done before. Now, I think it's a really great thing that people are really good at pattern recognition and taking a problem and recognizing that it fits into some pattern that they understand before. This is an important part about being a mathematician is to be able to make those connections. So the fact that you recognize a particular pattern isn't the problem. The problem is a sort of attentiveness to the small details and thinking that a pattern applies in a situation it actually doesn't. That is, what's sort of missing is an error catching routine. If you're programming, for example, you might have actually explicitly written an error catching routine that goes through and checks your code for certain types of errors. And this is a skill that a lot of first year calculus students actually are not great at, particularly if the professors are given bad tests where there's lots of time pressure and they don't have the, the time to run through it. That is, to go through your computations line by line and make sure that every line from one to the next is actually correct and apply some rule that makes sense. There's a certain mindfulness to that, and indeed, I've been influenced by Ellen Langer's wonderful book, The Power of Mindful Learning, where she describes the concept of overlearning. 
That is, if you're overlearning a particular procedure, so it just becomes rote, then you might stop focusing on the little details that actually might screw up a particular procedure. As you transition to rote memorization, the essential details can sometimes just sort of get blurred together. In our case, if you haven't memorized that basic process, you take the logarithm, you bring down the exponent, you take the derivative product rule, if that's your recipe, and it's a good one, it applies for a lot of times, you might not be focusing on the specific sub-details while you're executing that recipe. This is actually really important if you're a teacher. I found that one of my little teaching hacks when making homeworks or tutorial problems is to always be varying some of those little sub-details so that students don't fall into deep ruts where they can sort of mindlessly execute away without thinking about the individual steps along the way. The more variation you add, the less that people are going to fall into those kind of traps. Third thing relevant to this problem is about mastering the basics. For example, with log rules, there's a bunch of different log rules. Students sort of just memorize them. Often they don't really know why the individual log rules apply, like why can you take the exponent in a logarithm and bring it out the front? And as a result of being a little unclear about what all the log rules are, it means that if your procedure is like, and then do the log rule that makes sense, your error catching routine is maybe not quite sharp enough to catch the specific error that you're making. When prompted, you might be quoting the right rule, but when you're not prompted, you might just sort of fall into the rule that makes sense according to the procedure that you generally think works. So my tips are just to always focus on what the basic underlying facts are and why they're true so you don't have a doubt about them. To be running an error catching routine that hopefully lets you verify line by line what's going on in your problems. And most importantly, to engage in mindful learning where you're always thinking, why am I going from one step to the another and not just copying a procedure that you might have seen that sometimes works. Okay, so what do I think about this problem now as a teacher? And to be honest, I probably don't put this problem on a test again. As I said, it's highly on the procedural computational side of calculus. Personally, I'm actually a fan of the other side of this spectrum, where we're really focusing on learning calculus through its concepts, with clear geometric understanding of the ideas and ability to apply it to a wide range of problems. That's the part of calculus that most excites me, unless the sort of like, can I quickly and easily do the computations? That said, it's common for calculus courses, including mine and all around the country, to still include elements of procedural fluency. And I think part of this is because building up a procedural fluency actually makes you more effective at understanding the concepts, at being able to reason with them and apply them in a wide range of situations. Yes, you can always look up what a specific rule is. Yes, you can go to something like MapleLearn or Maple Calculator, and they're just gonna tell you what the derivatives are. However, there retains a sort of cognitive load if you're trying to deal with a challenging and complicated problem, and the basics are all things that you have to go back down to and verify and make sense and, and redo every single time. Perhaps another way to put this is that math is a language. And just as in language, you know, there's all sorts of words you have to know, grammatical constructions, how to put sentences together. What's more important is probably things like, can you construct a persuasive argument? But if your mind is always focused on those lower level skills, if there's a big cognitive load to those lower level skills, it just makes it harder to do the higher level reasoning. And I think this is very commonly the case in mathematics. And why sometimes people will tend to discount the value of lower level skills because they care about the, sort of the sexy stuff like the application and the conceptual reasoning and I care about all those things too. But I think we should focus at least a little bit on the procedural fluency. Alright, so that was my appeal. I hope you enjoyed it. My thank you to Maple Learn and Maple Calculator for sponsoring today's video. Definitely check them out, links in the description. If you have any thoughts or questions, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.